so glad that you are all here. Well, you can just help themselves, make yourselves comfortable. If you need more food, please do that. If you need to get up and move, for, to feel free to do that, whatever you need to do to be comfortable. Um, I am Rabbi Stacy Schlein. I'm the Director of Educational Capacity Building at the Jewish Education Center of Cleveland. So my job is Director of Educational Capacity Building. It's quite a title. Yeah, but what does it mean? What it means, <laughs> what it means is my job is to help all of the synagogue and early childhood programs maximize their capacity and to do better at the work that they do. So we'll talk, we'll talk after, we'll talk after. So what it means is we do professional development grants. We bring groups of educators together. And for example, Rabbi Josh Foster is the chair of our education directors network. So he and I get to do a lot of work together. So truly an honor to be here. Um, I was just saying earlier, this week's Torah portion, I wish we could sit all week and just study this Parsha. There's so much in there. And yet I am going to just focus in on one section. Um, during the pandemic, one of the things that I learned is that when you are in a session and teaching, <laughs> that if you provide the participants an opportunity to talk in the first five minutes, they will be more likely to talk throughout. So I wanna ask a quick thought question. We'll go around and share and it's, you, you're gonna say your name in one word and that's it. And then I am going to share a theory that I developed about Abraham and I wanted to get your reactions about it. We will end up zooming in on the Akedah, even though I want to zoom in on the entirety of the Parsha. We have to make choices. Um, and we'll take the discussion from there. I have some additional quotes. I have a feeling we're going to get into a very robust conversation. I anticipate we probably won't even get to the quotes, but they're available for you. So my question is, when you hear the word fear, what is one word that just pops into your mind? When you hear the word fear. fear. Okay, so we'll go around, you'll share your name and share your one word that you think of. And it's maybe not a word. I was first just thinking, I had to turn. Oh my God. But perfect. Oh my God. Perfect. Yes. That's awesome. We just smushed it together. Excellent. Um, Lentina. Uh, no, no. Iran and. Okay. Okay. Was that the right direction to go to? Wherever your head is, is the right direction. Okay. So the first thing that comes into your mind. All right. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't, can I just pass on? You may, thing? yes, you may. And we can come back or we just pass. Okay. Good. So it's Toby and uh, War. Okay. Bijan. Uh, and the word that comes to my mind is radical ashram. Okay. Right. Radical Aslam. Radical Islam. No. Aslam? Radical Aslam. Yeah. The American Academy of English Language corrected the uh, word Islam, took the word letter I with an A instead. So uh, Islam Aslam? became Aslam. Okay. Oh, and wow. I know this. You can go and read on it. I will. That's Thank you. That's official news okay. by American Academy of English. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the joke. <laughs> yes. Uh, Harvey, and the first word I had was trembling. Trembling. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, stress or anxiety. Thank you. 
but also it's the um, awe. Ah, okay. I'm James and also trembling. I'm Marlene, and mine is Courage of Zafir Mats. Okay. A, a word I learned uh, just a few days ago, a few days ago, coulorophobia, which is a fear of clouds. My cousin has been diagnosed with okay. that. And they say it'll take four years for him to get over it. Coulorophobia? Coulorophobia. Okay. Fear okay. of clouds. Like, Thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Panic. Uh, why? 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 That's my word. Okay. Good. Worry. Worry. Okay. I, I actually like that. Uh, there's a there's a lot to take in. Okay, so let's move into the Zoom. Um, I'll just do in the order that well, it's showing up. Oh, I'm going to wait till the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nelson. So in intensely focused. Intensely focused. Okay. Um, Shabbat Shalom, Peter. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Um, the word that came to mind was scariness. Mm. Scariness. Thank you. Shira. Okay, Shira. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Thank you. And Jackie, if you would like to share. Uh, the word that came to mind is panic. Panic. Okay, anyone else who would like to share? Yeah, so we're sharing when you hear the word um, Fear, what do you think of? Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Like your name, Lois. Lois, thank you. I, Ivan? Unknown. Unknown, okay. Any other? Another key. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, well, we'll let her get settled. So, you have one. I do. For, well, I have a lot of ones, I think. <laughs> and now I have even more because I've learned a couple of new words along the way as well. Um, I'm going to say today, in this moment, I'm going to say normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. normal. Yeah, normal. Yeah, it became normalized. So thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, I think it provides a really rich framework for understanding the complexity and the depth behind fear. And what I'd like to share with you, um, I had delivered a sermon on the Akedah and I created a theory about how I understand Abraham and the tension between fear and faith. So I'd like to share it with you, thinking about that focus on fear. And I want to hear your reactions to it. And it's an invitation to ask questions, push back, disagree, agree, challenge, all the wonderful things. So I'll share this with you first and then open the floor to questions. And hopefully we'll have time to actually look at the words of the Akedah as well. I will not offer by Raya Harnick. I will not offer my firstborn for sacrifice, not I. At night, God and I make reckonings. Who can claim what? I know I am grateful, but not my son and not for sacrifice. In the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, we learn that Abraham is being tested. And that statement is highly problematic. Yet, on some level, we know it's true. The Abraham that we see in the Akedah is radically different than the Abraham we see even earlier in this Torah portion and the one we were introduced to last week. When we think about Abraham, we like to reflect on his strong attributes, his greatest strengths, 
We know a person who is brave and willing to walk into unchartered territory, to pick up his entire life and to move forward in faith with God. And then in the Akedah, oh, and then, sorry, then later we meet an Abraham who's willing to put aside his fear of the stranger, beginning of the portion, and welcome guests into his tent. The Abraham that we look up to with pride has chutzpah, incredible chutzpah to argue with God to save Sodom and Gomorrah for the merit of just a few righteous. But in the Akedah, God says, take your son, your only son, the one that you love, Isaac, and go forth to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. And Abraham does not respond with any words. Abraham responds with actions and Abraham is swallowed by silence. He does not even ask a question. You want interruptions in the middle? No. <laughs> I think mean, I do, but no. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but remember it. Please. Abraham doesn't make a demand. And I would propose that the Abraham that we're seeing and experiencing in the Akedah, the one who cannot connect words to create a conversation, the Abraham who can respond with one word answers when he is asked a question, this Abraham, our father, Abraham Avinu, is completely frozen in fear. The American Psychological Association defines fear as an intense emotion, some of you kind of captured those, those ideas, that is aroused by a detection of a threat involving immediate alarm and also mobilizes the organism by triggering a set of psychological changes. And in general, this mobilization of the organism to take action. And they also state fear and anxiety are used interchangeably in our language. In fact, we had those terminology used with the group. Our human instinct is to avoid this fear and stressful situations because the physical response we have is so uncomfortable. And Dr. Lisa DeMore, a brilliant and well-known local author and psychologist explains in her book, anxiety is a gift and it's handed down by evolution to help keep humans safe. Every one of us is equipped with a sophisticated alarm system that is programmed deep into our brains. And when we sense that fear, it sets off this trigger of anxiety. And the discomfort of anxiety compels us to take steps to reduce or avoid this threat. And there's three autonomic responses that will happen, fight, flight, freeze. And when we think about Abraham, our natural desire is to think in the moment when Abraham is lavished with praise and promise and potential. Biblical scholar, Dr. Nahum Sarna explains, since the time of God's first call to Abraham in Haran, no experience of his proved his devotion to God was unconditional and boundless, not influenced by the many glorious promises he received or the wealth he achieved. Now, I see it slightly differently. Abraham is even more than the sum of his brave acts. Abraham does also have a dark side. And it's one I'm often nervous to discuss. When Abraham is afraid, he freezes and makes uncomfortable decisions. This also happens immediately before we get into the Akedah, when Abraham and Sarah and all of their people and possessions are making their way across Egypt. And again, they travel towards the land of Avimelech. And in both cases, Abraham is so afraid, he fabricates a story stating that Sarah is his sister. And so he can offer her to the king to save their lives. And in both of these situations, God intervenes makes the truth known. And Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were unable to conceive until 
they're miraculously blessed with a child. And now, after all of this struggle, all of this hardship, he is just, and just after he allows his wife, allows his wife to banish Ishmael, the child, from his union with Hagar, Abraham has to face the reality he is being asked to sacrifice the only child that he now has left. Now, our text says that God tests Abraham, but in reality, the reality is that life is the true test of faith. How we live out our values, how we apply our faith to our day-to-day -day lives, that is the test. And throughout Genesis, Abraham has been perpetuating a pattern of both passing and failing over and over and over again. And perhaps Abraham does need a wake up call from God since Abraham has not mastered how to do it in a healthy way. Rabbi Paul Kipnis in a commentary on the Akedah says, consider this prior to the Akedah, each encounter between God and Abraham occurs in a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation. But from this moment on, from the Akedah on, God never again speaks to Abraham directly. All further communication passes through an angel. Why? Because Abraham simultaneously passes and fails the test. He showed his love of God, yes, but he employed a violent means to pursue that love. And the use of an intermediary, the angel, proclaims a message for future generations. Abraham really didn't listen to God's teachings of compassion, did he? The Akedah is a clarion call to wake up and pay attention to the necessary tension created by a God of love and a God of, of fear. We talked about that, Yura. If we ear too far on one side or the other, we have a potential to lead astray. Abraham is so overwhelmed by this fear. When he's called to go to Moriah, he loses sight of God's love. And it appears that God did tell Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. But a God of love would never ask someone to sacrifice a child. Abraham needs to prove to himself that he can live a life of faith, even and all the more so when he faces his fears. Perhaps a God of love recognized Abraham's dedication, or maybe fear required help. So God sent an angel to intervene at the very moment he was about to go through with the sacrifice. But notice the story doesn't stop there. No, Abraham then substitutes the ram in place of Isaac without being told. And perhaps the true test was for Abraham to internalize and personalize the call of God. And perhaps God is being tested as well. When people freeze in fear, they need an intervention. Okay, I'm gonna share this next piece and then I can see people are like, I, they have to, we're gonna pause this. Let me share this one more piece. Um, Professor Naomi Gratz explains, Abraham's greatness is that he breaks the cycle of abusive behavior by not following his previous role models, his family, and by not sacrificing Isaac. God does not tell him to sacrifice the ram instead of Isaac. It is Abraham who is the one who sees. He sees the ram and has this click, this wake up moment. And in a decisive moment when he sees that ram, he of his own volition chooses to sacrifice it rather than his son. And God did not tell him to do that. Abraham chose to follow the second command, the angels 
he decided on his own that some of God's commands do not have to be obeyed literally, and they can be carried out symbolically. The ram in place of his son, that was Abraham's decision. He can say, I have choices, and this is what I chose. And this is his real test, the one where he reaches deep into himself with great courage and defies God's temptation of him to repeat the pattern of abuse. And Professor Gretz says, this is the test that he passes. Okay, so I know some people are already starting to look through. Let's open up, we're gonna look at page, it's on page 117, just so we have this. So when we have questions, we can refer to it. So, okay. You had wanted to say something earlier. We'll start here and then go to Sheila. Rabbi, can you give a chapter and verse? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you for asking that. 22. We're on chapter 22. 22 1. 22 1. I'm on 22 8. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Genesis 22 1. Okay. First yes. of all, I want to point out that 22 2 says. Yes. Lech lecha, just like the beginning does. Right. That which means that you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for me. Right. That's number one. Number okay. two is, and I, I'm not a Hebrew, so I probably don't have this. We, right. But we have some here. Uh, but the, I heard on some podcast or something I read recently that it doesn't say to go sacrifice Isaac. It says, go take Isaac, go up the hill and do a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say sacrifice Isaac. And so I think Abraham failed the test by not taking an animal with him to do the sacrifice in the first place. Okay. And that's okay. all he was doing was supposed to be teaching Yitzchak the right way to, to do, do a things. sacrifice. And the um, the part where you're connecting it to lech lecha and and because you're doing it for, you're your doing it for yourself, so to see if you're which if then you're correlates to your next piece. How is he going to internalize this act for himself and teaching his son? Exactly. Okay. Great. How far Working up, along on what Michael just said, it occurred to me listening to you the second article. Uh, he was going up mountain with Isaac, assuming he was going to sacrifice Isaac, I mean, that's the implication. Mm -hmm. um, but when he was ordered, he had he saw the ram and he felt he had to take something down. He had to have another reason for going up. Explain to all the people at the bottom of the mountain to all his servants. Mm -hmm. Why did he go up there? Been up there to sacrifice my son, right? And then I didn't do it. I mean, I have to explain this to the servants a little much, right? So his ex explanation is pretty much what Ron said. Oh, I wasn't going, I was just teaching him. Mm -hmm. And um, do what you want with, with that part, okay? Uh, as far as with your first article, ah. Uh, I think that he, in a way, got sick of fighting with God. Hmm. In other words, God Interesting. to keep testing him. God's testing him, and he's fighting back. Why would Sodom and Gomorrah? You have to destroy everybody. Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to do this? And he said, okay, let's see, God. Are you really as mean as you huh. think you are? I'm going to do what you say. And so, in and essence, say, and he's yeah. he's and testing he's God. With you. He's testing God. He's testing God in a way. Mm -hmm. And he goes too quickly to the end. In other okay. words, he gets... And it still doesn't answer the question about Isaac being bound. Right. right. And not only in Noah. Right. I mean, we're a team. Yeah. And he doesn't say anything. So as you were talking, I was thinking a little bit about, you were talking about not wanting to argue with God after all of these different experiences. I think we all have these moments of exasperation in our lives where perhaps you have conflict or you just don't want to rehash and go through things again. That I think that's a pretty natural response. There is also 
what's interesting when you were talking about all of that the um the words back and forth there is also all of the different actions that are being required and all of them emanate the name of the parsha vayera like and look to see right so that impact of all the different experiences he's physically undergone the lech lecha picking up and moving and going and then also everything that he has seen all of this destruction the you know, the, there's all these midrashim about him and his family and, and being in a time where child sacrifice. And so he's sort of held up because he did, we did not do that. We did not follow that custom. I want to go to the, um, the, I just want to read the verses you had asked. You shared that one um, interpretation and then we'll take your comment after. The description is, of the octave, that step by I step, step, right. So if we go here, like, so 22.1, sometime <laughs> afterward, God put Abraham to the test and said to him, Abraham, and he answered, here I am. And he said, take your son, your favored one, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. So, in, okay, so we have a couple of people who are, are Hebrew linguists, I think. In looking in the Hebrew of the of verse two, do you, I'm curious, like from the Hebrew perspective. Can you this? It's on 118. 118, thank you. 118. If we look at the Hebrew. Is he making it small print or is it my eyes? Hold on. No, I think it's, it's my eyes. It's your eyes. eyes. You see, it's also my eyes. I have to take my glasses off. Yeah, our eyes. <laughs> what do we what do we think about the Hebrew in this? Pachna et bincha. Right? Yachidecha. Asher hafta, the one that you love. Yitzchak, Velech Lecha, El Eret Hamoria, Veha Alehu, Sham. And so that's sort of like, I guess the question is, Veha Alehu, is that, refer, is that referring to Isaac? Yeah, the, the, the two of them are supposed to be them. Yes. Obvious. Yeah. Obviously, yes, because. Yeah, and you bring him up, Alehu. Right, so you're bringing no, him. Yes. There's nobody yeah. else there, so it's got to be him that you're bringing up. Ola. 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 Ola is a sacrifice. Right. Ola is the burnt Ola sacrifice. It's the same word there. Right. Right. It's the it's the same root. The burnt sacrifice is a is a way to lift up because you think about the embers, the smoke rising. Right. So it's wordplay there. Right. Le Ola. Al echad keharim. So it doesn't say to sacrifice. It says two of them should go up the right? mountain and do a, a sacrifice on well, the mountain. Yeah. I wonder, it makes me think, is this, is this we believe that it mm -hmm. um, is written down, the uh, Hamas was written down in like 500 uh, CE, uh, BCE. Um, that perhaps this was a story that went around in the editors were adding things to perhaps. make it. Perhaps. I mean, this language, yeah. this repetition, he was trying to make it a little, yeah, what can I say? Right. Not more beautiful, but more Indian. Indian. Yeah. Then it really appeared to everybody else. You've been waiting very patiently. No, I'm not very patiently. Oh, you <laughs> why not? You're a doctor. <laughs> so, um, Doctors are terrible. So I think it's not a more esoteric look at this. Okay. Uh, and, and Abraham being our first first contact, per se, with, with the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if I want to apply modern psychology yeah. or even accept that he is acting as a standard human right? Because he is now moving as a prophet and being in communication. Exactly. I, know, I think there are things about him that we just don't understand right. at a different level. I think the left which I hope they understand as he moved out of the world of the past, mm -hmm. I think we're now at the point where he's now moving out of the world of this left 
to Malai, to Malai, which we still don't know what that is, right. to this elevated level. I think the loss of speed ah. is if he's, there's a communication. What, what do we think? He, mm -hmm. the, the 10 times in the, in the Torah that we have, God said this and God, that's the only communication. That's the only time Abraham and God, I can believe. I don't think so. And so but this is I all that we know of. That's all we know of. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think at this point, he's transcended with his relationship to God. That it's not this human vocal communication. It's, at a it's beyond. Point. It's beyond. And in fact, you see his son later, who's very quiet, uh, mm -hmm. right? We talk about him being, you know, Isaac kind of gets real quiet. Mm -hmm. Maybe early on in our religion, there was this need for these early participants right. to have this certain very special relationship right. that doesn't come back down to us later until yeah. we have the... Uh, uh, Joseph and, and, and the like. So maybe yeah. there's that cultivation huh. time and, and that we're just seeing that transition here. So the silence that we're sensing is, it, it's not for us to see that. Really. It, it's a different yeah. way of looking at it. Yeah. Clearly as a prophet, I don't know if we can apply how I feel, how you feel. how The uh, modern the context, modern, the yeah. modern lens. Yeah, because I think there's it more. It could be something it's a, it's different. A uber person in a sense. Yeah, so yeah. it's well, an uber person. Right, hold that one second. So, um, I, so in hearing you say that, I think it raises some really important questions about who is Abraham to us as a prophet? How do we understand? How is it when we are praying, when we're saying the Amidah, we're praying to the God who we have established this relationship through Abraham, how much there's sort of this tension between him as an uber, uber human prophet? Okay. Uber. So do we do ourselves is a disservice in a way if we elevate him? Do we do a service to it? And where is where is our place in space and sort of honoring his role and who he is within his own context, his own life, and in ours? So you raised like some really, really interesting pieces. You've been, I, I want to, there were a couple of other people who are waiting. So we're one, two, and then Ivan, three. I have a question here. Okay. You do too. So what, yeah. she's been waiting. Oh, yeah. I will get you. Okay. okay. It seems, I will get you. It seems that the Hebrew is uh, ambiguous. Yes. Whereas in the English translation, um, it's not ambiguous. It right. says, you're going to take him and he's going to, yeah. you're going to offer him as a yeah. burnt offering. Right. So it, the translator yeah. and the, yeah. you know, people who, the committee that wrote Eitz Chaim, they decided um, how that was going to be translated. Right. And the, um, the JPS Tanakh, the way um, that it was developed. I, I love to imagine this. So it is. it was a collection, a group of scholars sitting around a room and probably like this, this. <laughs> exactly like this, which is why I like to imagine it, debating, trying to understand the context and different interpretations. How can we write it? How can we capture the meaning? How can we make it most accessible? So what happens in this translation, it ends up being the one that can be the most agreed upon which may not always be the one that's closest aligned to the Hebrew or the most poetic or historically accurate. It's the one that we could agree it, upon. Yeah. And, and the ambig ambiguity is very hard to translate. Yes, yes. Okay, next. And then I promise I'm coming over. Well. In, number seven. In seven, okay. Verse you seven. You get that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So first of all, Isaac knows, I mean, Abraham knows about what I'm doing. It's not a whole new thing, the substitute or whatever. Uh, but God, so somehow, either he is thinking, maybe it's not going to happen, maybe he's thinking about it, just in God, or God, but with this, all he's already having prophecy, seeing that um, he's doing this need for himself, so I don't know, Future generation thinking that the most he is the first. He is a whole nation after him. Right. So he's doing a lot of these, a lot of these tests, maybe as lessons for the people to come. Interesting. Maybe this is his way of saying, I'll tell you who, so that 
and internal issues of the anatomy will know to make sacrifice with your good opinion of the being able to do it because you know that's so interesting because you're you you were focusing in on for him and himself and then you're um shifting well we have the concept of uh, as Abraham as this human and not only that I like this, and not only that but understanding the, his role for the next generation and I would even say as a teacher he knows what God can do okay okay the problem with sacrificing him and having another tool I mean if he could have it you know if so right? I could have a kid in your mind. Perhaps. Okay, so this one was for God, and the first one is to see. And you know, a year or two later, they can have another one, and he will be the one to carry on. Okay. So maybe he, he's not that worried. Okay. Yes. So, so I have two questions. First Please. of all, Haleu Leola. Laalot means to bring him up, right. and Leola is to sacrifice. Yes. The other thing I have been Hayechitcha. He had more than one son. Right. So why is it mentioned Yechidcha? Why would it need to be mentioned? Yes. He was not his firstborn. Right. And, and also... He was not his only one. Right. So why is why it mentioned you... Yechidcha? That's why I, I, I have a problem with that. What, so say more about what your problem is. With it. I don't understand. Why would it be necessary? Why would it be necessary to say Yechidcha? But hadn't already uh, Sarah expelled Hagar and Ishmael by that point? So that, right. So it could be like technical, like now you own, it's as if right. you only have one because the other is exiled. Oh. Right. And your question raises though, is it even ever possible for him to only have one because he has two? Right, babe. Right? Because okay, hold well on. I know. Okay, okay. we're, we're going to come back, and I see Nelson's waiting too. Yes. Um, I want to talk about verse five. Verse five. Okay, verse five. we want to talk about verse five too. Let's see. Where are we? What page are we? 119. 119. Okay. Do you want to read it before you talk about it? No, so here's the English. Please. Then Abraham said to his servants, You stay here. And pay attention to the next three words. Okay. Mid the, the Hamor. What? Yes. The Hamor. The Until donkey. I come back. Okay. They raised the question why did Abraham tell his quote unquote boys or servants, now probably maybe Ishmaelite or something, you stay here with the donkey. Mm -hmm. You could have said, hey, wait here. I'll go and worship, I come back. What have you heard about the interpretation about this verse five? What is there? Is there anything out there? About the staying, specifically staying with the donkey, yes. that specific task and responsibility of watching the animal? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a highly non-PC interpretation. That, of course, anybody can have any interpretation they want. Yeah. But there is such an interpretation. Okay. Which is that probably that is how he referred to them. That is how he thought of them. He thought of them as equals to the Hamor? To the Something ass? like that. Huh. In terms of the way he thought about them. Oh, interesting. Which, of course, has historical connotations. Can I answer that? Yes, please. I, okay. I, do I, I, I said I myself, it's a non PC. I, I think okay. the reason he's mentioned the the chamor yes. was that up to that point, the chamor was carrying the, the wood. And now it's going to stay there. We're going to carry the wood. We have to do this ourselves. Okay, so that's then, why he so there, so that's why he's so then, the ants. Oh, because there's like the well, I mean, the donkeys are the great, donkey, you're actually, donkeys are much, yeah, right. they're great for going up a mountain, right? Like it would have been a whole lot easier than having to actually carry it. Um, so that's that's 
that's interesting. So then there's sort of the proximity. I'm coming here, taking the wood. You you keep the don the donkey, right? Um, it's possible. There's also like there's a lot of different midrashim about donkeys, and um, we you know we have speaking donkeys that happen later that are sharing like yep. oh, with prophetic, <laughs> right? So and yep, also. Please. In biblical times, your um, your wealth is through your animals and possessions you have. So it could be that. And also, it's a really interesting perspective. You want to respond? Go with go with Uberman. The ass and the, the other humans. I I, yeah. I don't think it's a derogatory. I think that's that's the normal world. And they, these two are now ascending, leaving like, the normal the world normal, behind. Normal. Again, uh -huh. getting closer to okay. this direct communication with God. So okay. I, I'm not saying it's, I don't think it's a negative. I think it's simply saying all the creation of the world, okay. six days, huh. we're leaving that down at the mountain. We're now elevating up to that next level. Yeah, there is, I think there's a major negative interpretation out there by some groups of people and groups of Jews hmm. that they say this is what it means. Well, and it has stayed historically that way to this point. Yeah, well, if we think about how, uh, because they were his, it says youth, but were they his servants? His boys, yeah. They're his boys, right? So they also are a possession. And also that's a, a sign of wealth too. Okay, we're going to go Nelson, Ivan, Sheila. Okay, Nelson, you're up. So one of the problems of dealing with this particular text is it's very important in lots of other religions. Yes. In fact, we like to speak sometimes to ourselves as one of the Abrahamic religions. And there's at least two others. Maybe there's more. I don't know. But what, he only has two sons. But at that point, the question is, who is going to be his heir? And uh, Isaac has an heir who's a servant, uh, but he's not gonna have an, an heir who's a servant because they're like asses. Mm. So he needs a son to have an heir. Mm. Now, I once had to give a talk to a Christian group about this particular story. And uh, somebody there, I think he was just trying to be a wise guy and trip me up and, and ask the question, uh, if God is, has foreknowledge, knows everything, why does he have to test Abraham? Doesn't he already know? Right, right. And my answer is that Ab he, God might have known what the answer is going to be, but Abraham didn't. Abraham had to discover himself. And so this, this is, in that sense, really a test of Abraham. I have an answer for that, if possible. <laughs> no, not really, but uh, what they say, and I've let it, over the years being in these classes, yeah. Sheila has mentioned this several times and many other people, that whatever that our Judaic tradition says don't is a sign that in those days we do. was and <laughs> was not an uncommon practice. Right. It was practice. Right. Charge sacrifice was, it was, you know, was there. So they say, don't do like others. So they use it really as an example to bring up a story, right? Of course, we don't want to say Bible is a story, but to bring up the idea, the concept that hey, other people do it that way, you don't do it. Right. Yeah. That's really the yes, one of my basics. One of my uh, one of my history teachers, um, Rabbi Dr. Martin Cohen, would always said would said that like any time when there's a law, it was because it was necessary to counter what was going on at the same at the same time. Okay, Ivan, and then Sheila. Well, you know, picking up uh, on what Larry said earlier, um, you know, there's- Go back. <laughs> there's, well, let me, let me just start like this. There's 11 trials, okay, that he has, uh, Abraham has. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, there's, uh, commands and there's promises and at the beginning there are more promises than commands it's like you know 
he's getting uh, the, the, the carrots before the stick, mm. okay? And he's learning uh, as he goes along. By the end, uh, when he, God tells him, take your son, your own son you love, there's just the command. There's no promises. And in the, in the end, Abraham is really showing, I believe, faith and trust. He's learned to have complete faith and trust in God. And in uh, 22.6, I think this is the most beautiful, these verses here beginning on 6. And, you know, we, and I think uh, someone alluded to these already. That was Larry. Mm -hmm. Okay, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the fire stone and the knife, and the two walked off together. Then Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, beautiful, it's so full of passion, Father. And he answered, Yes, my son. And he said, here are the firewood, here, is, here are the fire stone and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will see the sheep for his burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. This is the only time, I believe, when Abraham speaks to Isaac. In, in, I mean, is there another place? These are, this is the first and only time that they speak together. And it shows how much he loves his son and how much his son loves him and trusts him at this point. And in the end, it's just about, does he have enough faith and trust? In these all of these adventures, all of these trials, you know, he argued with Abraham. Uh, he argued with God about Saddam. Right. Will, you, will, the, will the, the, the God of justice judge justly? You know, and he, he protested, he debated. And it wasn't that he was shy, but by this time, he was a, he was 100 years old. Sarah was 100, a 90 when mm -hmm. they had right. uh, Isaac, right? And he knew he's the founding father. He's the he's not only the father, he's the founder right. of our religion. Right. And he we had 11 chapters before Abraham comes on. You know, of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve, the Tower of Babel, Noah, all the backsliding, all the <laughs> the, the the chaos that God would not put up with. Now we finally have the son. There's only one son. There's two sons, but only one is the right son. And, and the rest of this is going to be about that when the other coming into the other stories now with, with, uh, with Isaac continuing and Jacob, there's a right line. There's the wrong line and the right line, right? It's not Esau. It's Jacob, mm -hmm. right? It's not Ishmael. It's Isaac. There's a, and, you know, there was the right wife and the wrong wife. This is what Judaism is. It's, you know, progression. It's, it's finding, he, and Abraham has to learn how to be uh, a husband. He's, he doesn't treat Sarah properly. Right. In in many instances, he has to learn, and he he I think he finally learns that. But in the end, it's that in the end, this is all about trust and faith in God, mm -hmm. more so than even the love of his own son. And in a way, like when when you're you're speaking and framing it, it's also it's it's testing all, all the way around. So it's testing um, Abraham's faith in God. It's testing God's faith in Abraham, Isaac's faith in his father, 
and then the how right. the, there's an interplay that's developed by all those different components. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, and in the end, you know, it's true. He probably does traumatize Isaac to a degree and alienate Sarah to a degree. Right. But in the end, it not it about faith and trust, belief in God? Mm -hmm. I mean, without God, there's none of this. Right. And, you know, he wants to say, you have to show that you love me, trust in me even more than your own flesh and blood. Because in the end, Isaac, is a, it's a gift having a child. That's why it's delayed. And we see the same with, uh, with Rachel and Rebecca. They have difficulty <coughs> producing a child. And we see that, you know, we learn that ha having a child, any child, is a gift from God. Right. Very true. Um, okay, so Sheila's been waiting very patiently. Thank you. What uh, Ethan said and even Ivan, perhaps the length of this description, the very vividness of this description, is to show how important it is to not sacrifice your son. In other words, exactly. they made it more elaborate and more dramatic for that purpose. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to originally say is that um, after Isaac, Jacob's son, Joseph, answers Jacob. He talks back to him. <laughs> I wouldn't say talk back, but you know, he, he he does what he wants. He's a little bit of a trust. Then the kids talk, start talking back to the father and challenging him. Instead of challenging God, they challenge the father. Hmm. Hmm. The same thing, I mean, I think Ivan was saying that too, that Isaac's reaction is nothing. I mean, but his son, um, Jacob, uh, challenges. And then the mother interferes. He goes from father, mother, and then Joseph, the son. Right, right. If you want to, I mean, if you want to make a whole thing out of it and write a book, there's something. <laughs> yeah, and plenty of people have written many yeah, books I mean, about it, it, right? Just, yeah. Right. You figure things out. So it's, it's interesting going back to this notion of the um, the uber human, and I, I I'm really intrigued by this. Um, it is it's great, and there is this question about what it means to have faith and what it would look like, and that process and that experience. And I, the, the part of this that I find so challenging is that there's several pieces. One, um, I do think to some extent, it's not fair to critique Abraham. Who are we to say? What do we know? We didn't have the same experiences. And the roles, the responsibility, the process, that evolution, the change, all of those things are so hard. And I know for myself, I do not believe in a God that would call for a violent act, right? So then the question is in looking at this text, like how do you understand and, and look at this and understand the words? So I think that like all these different perspectives and the ways that we came at this and looking at it, we can see that that, that place, Mount Moriah is a place where um, there are, this massive test, Abraham learns to see. We also learn to see. There's also what is right in front of you and also understanding the, there is still a piece of Abraham. He is very much human. And people have these moments, even Abraham Avinu, overcome by this call, this responsibility, this passion, these drives, that he is not able to see exactly what is in front of him. And there are times where it becomes our responsibility to 
in a way to intervene and to be the angel to help other people, to say the one word, to, to help snap people out, to help focus in order to be able to take that journey in life, to take that spiritual journey of elevation, of lifting up, to be able to respond to that call of seeking meaning and purpose and enriching the world that we live in. So it's really an incredibly powerful lesson. And I wanna thank all of you for taking this journey with me and being so open and responsive, sharing your um, intellectual curiosities so beautifully with one another. And I wish each and every one of you a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have two, two more comments. Please. <laughs>